Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast, show number 78. Welcome to a real world MBA from the School of Hard Knocks, where entrepreneurs reveal what it really takes to make it. Whether you're already in business or you're on your way there, this show is for you. This is Bigger Pockets Business. How's it going, everybody? I am Jay Scott, and I'm trying to change up my inflection, but it's not working. I'm still Jay Scott, and I'm still here with Carol Scott, my lovely wife. And one day I'll think of a new intro, but until then, how you doing, Carol Scott? <laughs> I'm laughing at you. I'm doing great. I'm a little bit bummed, though. It occurred to me that right around now, would have been the 2020 Bigger Pockets Conference in New Orleans. Oh. oh my goodness. We miss our Bigger Pockets family so, so, so much. But that'll make 2021 even sweeter, right? <laughs> Gotta look for those positives. Yes. We just, we're gonna get through. We miss everybody, but we will see everybody next year and hopefully talk to everybody many times in between. Um, Let's talk about our episode for this week, because we have an awesome episode this week. We have somebody that a lot of you probably know. His name is Nathan Brooks. He is the founder of Bridge Turnkey Investments. And the reason you may know him is that he's actually been a guest on the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Podcast four times now. So Nathan, he is um, a turnkey investor, and we'll talk about what that means. Uh, over the last five years, he and his company have renovated and sold over 500 houses. This year, his company made the Inc. 5000 coming in at about, I think he said, 1,304. So one of the Inc. 5000 this year. And while Nathan is a real estate investor, and while a lot of what we talk about on this show is related to real estate, we're a business show. And so on this episode of the podcast, we're not going to talk all about the stuff that Nathan has talked about on the real estate podcast. We're going to talk about his real estate business, but we're going to talk about it from a business perspective. So if you're a real estate investor, you're going to love this episode because we're going to talk all about things that are going to relate to you and your real estate business. And if you're not a real estate investor, you're going to love this episode because we're going to be talking about how to build and scale and grow a business, whether you're in real estate or not. So an amazing episode with an amazing investor. On this episode, we talk about things like using KPIs, which stands for key performance indicators, basically how to measure your metrics in your business and why it's important. We talk about creating processes, and we also talk about when we should not be creating processes. Uh, we talk about building an amazing culture in your business. Um, and then Nathan dives into what we need to do to be amazing at hiring employees. And we talk about the single biggest component of hiring that we're often afraid to do, but is so important when we're hiring in our business. So if you're thinking about hiring somebody, this is a must listen for you. And then for you real estate investors who are excited about hearing from Nathan Brooks, a real estate investor himself, we do talk about some real estate specific stuff, like how he's finding deals in this market and how he's finding and financing his deals in this market, how he's finding money and financing his deals in his market. And then the one thing we talk about throughout the entire episode is Nathan is a voracious reader and we talk about, I think, six or seven or eight great book recommendations. Overall, this is just an amazing episode that any real estate investor or any business owner is just going to get so much out of. So if you want to learn more about the things we talk about, about Nathan, about his business, check out our show notes at biggerpockets.com slash bizshow78. Again, that's biggerpockets.com slash bizshow78. Now, let's jump into our episode with Nathan Brooks. Nathan, welcome to our show. We are so looking forward to chatting with you. You are such an awesomely inspirational and multifaceted business person. There are so many great things to talk about. So thank you for being here today. Oh man, Carol, Jay, uh, I'm so pumped to be here. I so appreciate that uh, introduction and uh, it's a blessing to be here with you guys for sure. So I am pumped. <laughs> awesome. Well, we are thrilled to have you. For anybody that's listening that doesn't know Nathan, um, basically you are a real estate guy. So this is going to be a real estate related episode, but 
Even though you're a real estate guy and you've been on the Bigger Pockets real estate podcast four or five times now. Yeah, four times. Four times now. Um, we're going to talk about your real estate business, but we're going to do a little bit different. We're going to talk about it from the business standpoint because a lot of people out there, they may run real estate businesses and this is going to be an opportunity for them to, to really learn how a real estate business is run. And then there are plenty of people out there that don't run real estate businesses, but like we talk about all the time, business is business and learning how somebody runs their real estate business translates into running other businesses and vice versa. So thank you so much for being here and being willing to share your business story and, and all your business expertise and knowledge with us. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I love that. I love the connection between real estate uh, and business and it's, it's learning both ways. Right. So I learn all the time from people who are in business outside of real estate uh, because it gives us a different vantage point, but you know, solving so similar problems or opportunities or whatever that might be. And uh, so there's a lot of cool things that intersect there. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. So let's start with, for those who don't know who Nathan Brooks is, tell us a little bit about your backstory, what you've done in the past, what you're doing now and, and what your business is. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Nathan Brooks. I'm out of uh, the Kansas City area and I have a beautiful wife and two awesome kiddos. And uh, we just enjoy the heck out of uh, living on 11 acres and doing all kinds of stuff like... Uh, uh, hunting and shooting guns and fishing and boating and uh, playing and just enjoying the outdoors and nature. And this time of year is amazing with all the trees changing. And uh, so just enjoying that. And uh, as far as uh, you know, professionally, uh, we have a turnkey company, Bridge Turnkey Investments. This is our going into our sixth year of business. And so we have about 15 employees and uh, we made the Inc. 5000 list this year for the first time, uh, which was cool. I think 1304 was our number uh, out of 5,000 fastest growing companies. Uh, so, you know, it's just a number, but um, it's cool to represent the effort that our team has put forth. And so uh, what we do is we buy, renovate and sell homes and uh, we do that at scale. Uh, we've done a little over 500 houses so far in the last five years. And this year we'll put about 140 or so on the board. Uh, so it's quite a few. Uh, it takes uh, lots of learning and lots of amazing people doing amazing things. And so, um, you know, over the last four or five years, six years, uh, it's been uh, the story of that business and bridge. And kind of, I got my inception story, if you will, on the Bigger Pockets podcast, going through trying to do it myself and uh, going, you know, the boom and bust in the in the past recession, 08, 09, uh, which wasn't fun. And I've told that story a bunch of times, but um, it sucks. You don't want to do that. And uh, so, you know, I've really put the focus now on our team and what our individual and collective strengths are and how can we do that together as a company. So I don't know if that did, did a justice answering there, but. That is awesome. Congratulations, by the way, Nathan, on making it on the Inc. 5000 list. I can't even imagine what an honor that must have felt like after all of your amazingly hard work all these years. So cool. You know, it's it's cool. It's it's a neat uh, thing. And it's kind of one of those things, too. I mean, it's you have to apply for it. And, you know, there's other people, obviously, that uh, have not applied. And they, they, I'm sure they would be on there. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, something that's, it's kind of a cool benchmark to see where you're at and kind of, what are you doing? How, what are you producing? And also a cool place to, to kind of gather, uh, your team and celebrate some successes, uh, amongst things that are, you know, either challenging or whatever's going on in the business it, it, you can, you can kind of stack hands on that. So it's very awesome. Cool. Super. And I want to come back to the whole team building aspect and culture building aspect of your company as a whole at some point later in the conversation. But to set the stage even further, can you give us a little bit more information about how turnkey is different than flipping? Absolutely. So there's there's really kind of two components there, Carol. So uh, the flipping, you know, anybody kind of does that in the real estate business. If you are a flipper, quote unquote, you're, you know, buying it for whatever price and you're doing maybe something or maybe nothing to it um, and selling it. So there's, you know, many variations as, um, as you can think of really in that. But for us specifically, we are buying 
renovating it to a, a serious level. Their, our properties are beautiful. We're obsessed about detail uh, in every measure of process and data and KPI, whatever you want to talk about, we can go there uh, in our you know acquisitions, construction, transactions, and sales and marketing. So uh, it's, it's vitally important and, and it, it will make a massive impact. I was telling Jay uh, uh, but when we were kind of prepping for this, but um, the turnkey component of that specifically is about what the exit is. And so we are talking to folks all over the United States and internationally, even, you know, many um, soldiers, um, current military folks, and we'll shout out to ADPI, active duty, uh, passive income guys. They're so awesome and helping people literally uh, all over the world who are serving, uh, which is just awesome. So it's a blessing for us as a company uh, to help be in, uh, you know, working with them. But uh, so we help people who want to invest money. So say you're, you know, we have clients who are, you know, uh, blue collar working as a, a police officer or firefighter or, uh, you know, working in trades or something, but they're on the East coast, West coast, and they don't know what to invest in, or it's expensive, or they're not finding something that they want, or they don't have time to figure out all those things. Like how do we buy it and what do we pay for and how do we renovate it? And uh, so then we help them deploy capital in an, in a great asset and utilize this incredible uh, interest rate environment that we have right now and, uh, and, and utilize all of the benefits uh, that real estate has to offer. So that's kind of, I don't know if I wrap that in a much more uh, business centric uh, package there, but um, that's what we do. So is it safe to say that basically what you're doing is equivalent to a flipping business, except that your exit strategy and your end customer as opposed to being a homeowner, a, a retail buyer, is going to be somebody that wants to buy the property to hold long-term for cash flow. So basically you are flipping, but you're reselling to a landlord um, who's going to hold the property and, and keep it under management. Yeah, exactly. So first of all, you hit, hit on the exit. So we're thinking about, really, we serve two clients in this in this transaction, if you will. One's purchasing it and one's going to call it home. So we have to be thoughtful on both of those people. And so, you know, it, unlike, you know, when you watch on HGTV and you see some, which I don't watch, by the way, I can't can't watch it like a cop watching cops, right? But um, uh, <laughs> I live it during the day. I don't need it during the night. Uh, anyway, so uh, the 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 exit we're thinking about, okay, as a, as an investor, what are those components that are important to you and how are you going to be thinking about this? Like, do, can you give me what the scope of work was and what's the condition of the roof or what did you do uh, in the bathroom? Does it have new plumbing? Did you, you know, take out a permit, uh, you know, if it was necessary. So we're solving it for, for them. And does it make mathematical sense as a, as a quality investment? And what, as you're deploying your capital and you're thinking about growing your wealth, and that's our mission, by the way, it's literally building a bridge to wealth and freedom through real estate. And, and, and that's our target. That's our niche uh, and how we help people do that. And uh, so then the second is the tenant, right? So we want to think about, hey, mama shows up and she's thinking about, hey, can I do I like the kitchen for having the birthday party or dad's like, Hey, am I in the back? Uh, you know, throwing a barbecue, having the family over or whatever. And of course anybody can make those decisions. I just made it as an example. Uh, but you know, the point being, we want it to be beautiful, but we also want it to be as tenant proof as possible. So when somebody moves in there, we can reduce the cost. We can have as little possible, um, you know, cost and turns and also keep people there as long as possible. If we, you know, houses that have jacked up uh, layouts or weird, weird things about it, it might look good on paper, but you keep having that turnover because people move in and, and people don't like living there. So, you know, we really try to take both of those things into account. So let, let's talk about how your business is set up. Um, I know in, in my flipping business, and obviously we talked about the commonalities in flipping, but there's also uh, places where it's very different. Um, our business is basically, Carol, my business is basically we have acquisitions, we have the rehab piece, we have the sales piece, and then we have the raising money, the financing piece. Mm -hmm. Is Do you structure your business similarly, similarly to that? Do you have additional pieces? Do you not have some pieces? How? What does the internal structure of your business look like? Yep. Great question. And you guys have beautiful rehabs too. And, uh, you know, it's awesome watching somebody operate like that. And I think it's, <laughs> it's easy to, to just pass over like, Hey, this is actually, it's, it, 
it's it's easy, but it's simple, but not easy, right? There's uh, and and you can do that, uh, and doing it at scales is a is a whole nother animal. But um, so our business, we have we have. Uh, I think it's four. I say four before I tell you the what they are. But uh, we have acquisitions, uh, transactions, uh, construction, and sales and marketing. So four. I got it right. Whew. Okay. And I guess finance would be five. Um, so never mind. I got it wrong. But uh, <laughs> I'm not good with math anyway. Uh, so uh, the the departments themselves have evolved over time. And I think, are you kind of going after the management and structure of this thing? Is that kind of where you're thinking? Um, cool. So when, for us early on, it was, you know, we're buying houses. Great. Nathan, go buy houses. And, you know, I'm a high, you know, high D personality. I'm like, sweet, you know, bang, got a house. Uh, no problem. I got it. Uh, so, so now, you know, going from that uh, cowboy approach to really systematizing and coming through and, and, and by the way, a lot of pain, a lot of learning and a lot of trying to understand, Hey, what Nathan, you're, you actually really are not good at this at all. And you should not be doing it. By the way, you are no longer allowed to do it and you're fired and go do something else that you're good at. So finding people who are really good at those processes. So onboarding of, um, let's say acquisitions, how do we underwrite it? What is in our buy box? What would we buy? Uh, uh what, what um, you know numbers as far as our rate of return? Uh, what is the cap rate for that investor? Uh, you know wh- how long is it going to take us? What is the cost of renovation? So there's a lot of detail all of a sudden that becomes very pertinent as you look at it and can kind of uh, look at the lag uh, indicators of what you know the performance of these things over time. And then uh, in our you know f- uh, transactions, uh, we you know my business partners help raise a lot a lot of money. Um, so we we operate with a lot of private money, which is awesome. And so you know it's very streamlined at this point within our Podio, which is basically an open architecture. Uh, for people who are not familiar, you can literally take any data point, you know, name, address, phone number, amount, you know, date, whatever. So a lot of that stuff's uh, already. It, it, using a thing called Globiflow, it's it's automated. So whether it's ordering title or ordering insurance or uh, you know closing scheduling a closing or even you know almost to the point of sending out contracts and all that stuff, everything uh, automated. But um, you know ordering that lender money, tying it up with the title company, making sure the contracts all together. So there's a lot of components, and I don't know how far deep down that rabbit hole you want to go, but. Those are the the departments of our of our company. Awesome! Thank you for uh, giving us that structure and painting that picture of what the whole overall organization looks like. That's really helpful. So I'm curious, Nathan, to kind of uh, move this discussion even further beyond the real estate world and to mm-hmm. make it even more applicable to anybody who's starting a business or owning a business and looking to serve the different types of customers. Like you mentioned, for example, you're really serving two customers. You're serving the landlords, these people who are purchasing the houses, and the people who are eventually going to be the tenants, right? And there are some different needs and wants and wish lists among those people. So that's kind of point number one. And then you mentioned that you're very detail-oriented and data-driven in every single aspect of your decision-making for all of these components of your properties, right? So my question to you is, how do you recommend other business owners go about the process of really full on building those systems and processes so that we can really ultimately serve our different customers in the way that makes the most sense for everybody. Yep. Great question. Uh, so data driven and process driven is, is not by nature for me. And I think a lot of people out there, and uh, if you follow disk profile or the PI predictive index or culture index or whatever, you can see over and over this like visionary personality type. Uh, and in the book traction is great. It talks about a uh, integrator and a visionary. And they wrote a second book called rocket fuel, which kind of describes further in depth that relationship. And so, you know, I sit firmly in that visionary seat, you know, 10 new ideas are really a thousand new ideas a week. Almost all of them stink. Uh, and you have, you know, what happens is you don't have a platform or a person or a process to 
to funnel that stuff. And so you just create, you know, as my business partner calls, you know, I'm professor chaos. I'm just constantly putting stuff in that system. And so over time I've had to learn, first of all, who is, who's good at building those processes. What are the really important numbers that we can suss out? And it's me for as sitting in the CEO seat, what can I, can I, you know, suss it down to a few important numbers, but it doesn't mean that the data set isn't huge. It just means that we are able to take all that data and pull it down into something that's really meaningful. And so I think if somebody's really starting to to think about that right now, uh, whatever size businesses, you know, we have you know 15 employees. It might be big, might be small to you, but um, if you're having these challenges, you have to start you know just applying 80-20 principle. And if you haven't done it in 80, any department, you start with just what's the biggest problem? What where do we need to identify this? You know, in our business, it was in construction. It's a huge problem. It's a lot of moving parts, millions and millions of dollars on the streets all the time. And so, how do we you know single out problem after problem? after problem, which is, I like problems, right? We just want better problems. And we solve that problem, we want a better problem. So that's fine. We want problems. Uh, but you know, somebody like me who says, you know, hey guys, I don't understand why are we not closing this deal on time, right? So that's not a process-driven question, but we can process, we can come at it with a process-driven solution or answer, which is, okay, well, let's look at the number of days uh, under renovation. Let's look at the number of problems and inspection items. Let's look at which contractor was on that job. You know, we can, we can start to back into those questions and recognize that at the end of the day, uh, here's the other thing uh, that terrifies me and is a wonderful opportunity, which is from a process standpoint, do you need that process? What is most important? And are you running something that actually is making a difference? And knowing the difference in that in your business where people have autonomy and they need to run something or you, you know, having focus, having a process that gives you kind of the dimensions to live in and operate within, but also being able to have somebody actually go and do that job uh, as opposed to you just, you know, sticking there and trying to, uh, you know, automaton uh, the thing that you want to do, but that's being done by a person. Excellent. And to follow up even more, I think there's one, there are so many nuggets, but there's one I want to hone in on a little bit more. You mentioned really think about, do we really need a process for this particular item, right? I feel like myself included, a lot of new business owners and a lot of even seasoned business owners, we become so, so bogged down with so many things going on all the time. So many Mm -hmm. fires, so many opportunities, so many challenges that you become really Really overwhelmed when it comes time to really make a concerted effort to develop these systems and processes. So I really love, especially what you said about taking a good hard look at do we really need in an explicit process or system for each one of these areas. So, and you mentioned also, you know, really applying the 80-20 principle. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so I wrote down how to focus. And, and again, that's, that's a, that's such a problem, right? Because in, in anybody that's excited about something, it's, and it, that, that's the wonderful thing about entrepreneurship. And it's the most horrible thing about entrepreneurship because you can do anything. Uh, and, 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 and of course, if you sit in the entrepreneur hustle grind, whatever, uh, nobody can tell you otherwise, uh, that you should or shouldn't do that. Um, so, you know, I think, First of all, uh, like in our business, we had to come back and say, what are we doing this year? You know, what are, what is our goal in five years? We're going to own this many units. Okay. Well, over the next five years, what do we have to do? And now we backtrack into that. Okay. And again, back to the book traction and the, they have a thing called um, the vision traction or organizer, which lays out all the things from literally uh, who we are, what our core values are, which is something we spend a ton of time on. And we're looking through the lens of that. Uh, What is our organization? How are we going to operate? What's our mission? Okay, great. Five years from now, this is what our big, hairy, audacious goal is. All right. So if it if that's our goal in five years, then what are we going to do in three years? What are we going to do in uh, year one? And now we have to backtrack by quarter and say, okay, well, in order to hit that this year, we're going to track it by rocks. And this comes back to that data analysis and process and be able to say, all right, where are we in regards to this idea? And then if we're going to put an idea on the board, we we attack it. And uh, we, we take that iron sharpens iron approach and we say, all right, Nathan, you have a million ideas. Is this a good one? 
is this losing focus? Or are we still on the same thing? Have we accomplished the goal that we already set out? By the way, you better identify one because everything is nothing and the one thing is everything, right? We cannot make choices uh, every day to, to focus on something else because you just can't simply do that. A rifle has one bullet. You can't pull the trigger uh, and aim at everything. You just can't. So, um, and that, that this is a nightmare for a visionary to say, I can't believe, I hate these words even coming out of my mouth because Jay, Carol, I have so many ideas and I want to, I want to do all, everything. And I, and it's just so fun. And you know what? My team, they're like, Nathan, this, this is great, but you're really causing anxiety and, and a nightmare. So guess what? I, I work out all the time. I have a meditation practice that I've worked on. I have journaling uh, in my life on a regular basis. I take notes and I shut up when I have ideas and let my team operate. And so when we have ideas, it's great, but we need to have a platform and somebody who is a process-driven thinker, data thinker, to come back and work through those things with us so we can really identify what's a great idea, what's a good idea, what should be put on the whiteboard like I do in my office. I have a four-by-eight whiteboard. If it's an idea that's good and it's standing the test of time, it lives on the whiteboard and then it eventually becomes a thing. And if it stinks, it eventually gets wiped off and in place something else. So uh, I, I'm, I'm super passionate about this, uh, this topic. I, I love this. And you've, <laughs> the discussion we've had, I feel like I could take this in 20 different directions. We could talk about hiring at this point. We could talk about KPIs. We could talk about your CRM system, raising money, acquisitions. I mean, we've hit on so many things. So I'm going to have to pick from 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 these and, and head in a direction. Um, but I, I will hit on a bunch of things. But let's start with KPIs. And for those listening, KPIs are key performance indicators. They're the things we measure in our business. And uh, a lot of times we just refer to them as metrics. But if you have to apply a fancy word, KPIs. KPI is kind of the fancy acronym we apply. Um, as real estate investors, KPIs are important. As business owners, KPIs are super important. So can you talk to us a little bit about how you use KPIs in your business, how you define them? And again, if, if for our real estate investor listeners, this will be directly applicable for our business owner, not real estate investor listeners, still very applicable. Talk to us about how you derive the KPIs that you're going to use, how you track them, how you how you um, review them with your team. What What's your process around KPIs? Okay, great question. Uh, so uh, again, I'll, I'll use this caveat to say that um, I have grown to love KPIs. I just don't love trying to figure them out. So it's not my gift. It's not someplace I find joy. It's it's like a life-sucking uh, source for me. And so I want people to understand you don't have to love figuring out that stuff. You just have to start understanding why it's important and how you apply it. So uh, for me... Uh, it became, you know, it, there's a lot of evolutions of it. And, and what's interesting about KPI is that uh, it's literally just a data point. So if you have something that you can track, you know, a spreadsheet's probably, well, on a, on a notepad is probably the worst case scenario. But, you know, Google Sheet, you know, next level. And then Podio now uh, for us, uh, between QuickBooks and Podio, we can literally basically track anything and pull any data up that we want. And just to step back real quick, because you mentioned Podio twice, but I have mm -hmm. a feeling that there's going to be a number of people in our audience that have no idea what Podio is and what it offers. Can you give us a, before you go on, talk, talk to us a little bit about what Podio is? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it's like an open architecture thing uh, that you can literally put data, you could track clients, you can uh, you know send mailers out. We use it to, uh, I think I maybe even mentioned this earlier, order title. Uh, there's, uh, you could track like, cost of goods sold. We can track the number of houses that we have pending for the month or the week or the day, or we can track literally any data point that you put in there. Um, you can track it. So, or, or manipulate it or look at it or whatever. So, um, it just, just a 30 second overview, uh, reader's digest version. So in, in our business, when it, when a, an idea, which is, you know, the beginning, uh, which is a lead, a potential house, it goes into podio and within about 30 seconds, 60 60 seconds, it spits out a couple numbers that tell us like how possible would this deal work? Would it work for us uh, as a buyer? Would it work for, uh, you know, pricing for the tenant? Would it work for our clients? Right. So boom. And then now we, we create that into a, a listing and that listing tells us, 
hey, the transaction coordinator can make notes here and say who the title company is and what's their contact information. And by the way, when the buyer buys this, here's uh, their contact information and the closing date and so on and on and on and on. So um, that that uh, that literally runs all the way through the sales and, and closing, you know, including construction, who the manager is, who's the con, uh, the contractor on the job. So we can literally track anything and then pull back, uh, to that data. So did I, did I put it? Yeah, that, that was, enough? that, that was perfect. So it's basically a, an open architecture database that you can customize to track whatever types of information in your business that might be important. So if you have a real estate business, obviously all tracking all the stuff related to your real estate transactions, but it could relate to any business and, yep. and it's basically just a way to track the metrics and, and the data in your business. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So, it, and it's, it's a wonderful thing and uh, we, it's, it's definitely evolved over the years for sure for us. But so uh, I think coming back to the question of KPIs, so uh, we're saying kind of what what are they and how how do we make them important? Is that and, kind of and the, how do you track them and, and review them, them and yes. use them in your business? Okay, perfect. Uh, so for us, we we t we take it a, a number of different ways. So we can go as microcosmic as. Uh, you know, looking at our acquisitions department, or you could apply this to any business who's somebody who's picking up the phone and making a phone call, right? So if you are outbound sales, uh, we're looking for houses to buy, right? But whatever that widget is, uh, you want to you want to talk to somebody. So that's that's a step one, right? We need a lead. We need some, but we need a, a somebody who wants to do something. Second, uh, was it an opportunity? Did we did we uh, aim and fire at that? So in our business, that's write a contract. And then number three and the sexiest of all those babies is putting that sucker under contract, right? So we want to buy, we want to put four under contract a week in our business uh, because we also know what, you know, based on KPIs and our data, uh, what our fallout rate is, say percent. So uh, we know in order to hit our goal, coming back to that, you know, on uh, vision traction organizer, how many deals we're going to do for the year, you know, quarterly rocks all the way back, you know, boom, now we're back to our KPIs that tell us, are we on or off track? Uh, so that's within acquisitions. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a little bit higher level. So like, for instance, within our uh, construction department morning huddle. So we do morning huddle in all the departments, uh, construction acquisitions, uh, construction. Uh, we'll talk about like, all right, these are the ones that are closing this month. Right. And we need to close, uh, we, we need to sign off this many houses, which is, you know, complete the renovations, uh, to deliver these on time quality and budget to our transactions department so they can close them. Right. So that client can buy them and that tenant can move into them. And if those things are off track, then man, you have a problem with, uh, you know, the title company who's expecting to close it. You have a problem with the uh, lender who has a rate lock on that property and they are expecting to close it or they are, you know, there's additional costs or, or, trouble there. So, um, then we can come out a further, uh, way. So we use it within our advisory team and say, Hey, this is the financial performance of our company for this week, this month, this quarter, this is what happened. This is the challenge we can see because looking back, we know how, how long it's taking us to close or, you know, uh, run construction or whatever. So we can look forward then to say, Hey, our, if we hit our averages, this is where we're going to be at. And then we can also communicate that to our team. And each person like, hey, what are you responsible for? Uh, in sales, it's their sales guys. How many houses did you sell? You know, transactions. Did we close everything on time? Construction. Did we get it on time, quality, and budget? Uh, sales and, you know, marketing. What What is the impact in our Facebook, you know, or our Instagram or whatever? So we can we can look back out as, as um, big or small, macro or micro, and be able to say, hey, individuals are responsible for their individual numbers, but then as a collective, we're responsible for our, um, for our, you know, ultimate few numbers, which is, you know, our profit, gross profit, revenue, uh, and net profit, of course, which is the most important number in, in any business from the financial perspective. I, I love this. And it, it sounds like you are using KPIs in basically two ways. One, it's allowing you to, um, to set the targets in your business. So basically, you know that if the people that are calling on houses, let's say you're, you're doing cold calling, um, for every 100 calls they make, maybe they're going to get uh, 15 people that, that say, hey, yeah, come take a look at the house. And for those 15 people, maybe you're going to get eight 
that that you write a contract on. And of those eight, maybe you get one that you actually close. So now you know, because you're tracking those metrics, you know that you need to make 100 phone calls to get to that one sale. Yep. And you know, if you want to do 100 houses this year, then you need to make 100 times 100, 10,000 phone calls to hit your target of getting 100 houses. So number one, you're using KPIs to help you set those targets and define what people in your business need to be doing in order for your business to grow and get to where it needs to be. And then number two, you're using KPIs to track whether people are actually doing that. So going back and saying, okay, we, Joe Smith, who's sitting at the phones, um, he made a hundred calls or 500 calls last month. In theory, he should have gotten five deals out of that, but we only got two deals out of that. So maybe, um, whatever the processes are around our calls, Joe's not doing it correctly or optimally because he didn't get five deals. He only got two deals. So what could he be doing differently to get his numbers and his metrics up? Do, do I kind of have that right? The a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And, uh, you know, and that's almost kind of like that pre, uh, you know, lagging and, and leading indicator kind of, kind of question, I think is what you're, you're getting after and your very analytical brain, uh, unlike mine. But, uh, I think it's, it's like the simplicity and complexity of it all at the same time, which is like, Jay, did you make your phone calls? <laughs> uh, you know, Carol, did you make the sales calls or did you, you know, call the title company on this deal? Um, but at the same time, uh, what's interesting, and I, I was, you know, Jay and I were debating on this, uh, ch chatting about it, but I told him that the, the unbelievable amount of, uh, time and attention in our construction department will literally lead to a seven figure uh, additional uh, revenue to the bottom line if we hit all our targets, our, all our metrics. And by the way, our, our team will benefit from that. Our, our business will benefit from that. Our clients will benefit from that just in our performance and the product we're delivering. And of course, as a business, we want to be successful uh, in all ways, including financial. So, uh, it, and that's literally from from time after time obsessing. Uh, did we set the target? So I wrote down set targets and understand what happened. And then did people do that? And uh, that's what you those, that's what you said, Jay. And uh, and then literally dissecting it, training on it, and then lo and behold, let's go back to the question we were talking about before: process. So then, where did we screw up? Where is the process missing? What do we have to obsess about now? And then. Uh, guess what? Back to focus. What's the big problem? What's the little problem? What's a big problem? What's the little problem? And we get to go back and forth. And that's the thing is, is that uh, as a business owner, sometimes you are more in the weeds than you want to be, but you want to as quickly as possible, get back out of the weeds uh, and encourage, elevate and, and uh, give the people on your team the opportunity to solve these problems. And, uh, you know, our COO in our business and our sales and marketing director uh, on, in our business and my business partner all bring different things. And so we say, team, this is a problem. What are we going to do about it? And we can, we can approach and utilize our geniuses and our gifts and not trying to, uh, we can row in the same direction, but, uh, utilize our different gifts as we, you know, solve those problems. I love this. I really love this. And I think it's really powerful how you as the CEO of your company talk very directly about allowing the other team members, not only allowing them, enabling them and expecting them to and giving them the opportunity to become problem solvers, to establish best practices, to figure out the next best direction for whether it be a long term goal for the company or smaller components within achieving those goals. So I would love to talk even more about building that culture and the best practices around it, right? So you mentioned all these things about communicating regularly with all of your team members about their roles, their goals, impacts, and their metrics. You talked about how you're always keeping and moving ideas around on the whiteboard rather than just saying, we're doing this, we're doing this. You have a different process and practice around staying focused and making sure everybody is is looking toward the same goal. You talked about morning huddles, all of those great things. So what are some of the things, Nathan, that you employ in your business that you would consider best practices 
is that maybe to you, after all this time of growth, or just kind of, it's just what you do, you may not even necessarily see it as a big light bulb moment anymore. But to other people, these are really, really helpful things, these great nuggets that we might be able to employ in our businesses to keep us moving forward. Whew. Man, I've screwed up so many things. So there's so many opportunities to talk about these problems. Uh, so this could be its own show, guys. I, uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I wrote down a few things and I'll, I'll, I'll start with the uh, story and I'll be as brief as possible. So I was at a mastermind event and um, I was reading, I think at the time, I'm, a, I'm an avid reader and, and uh, I think it was Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink. And uh, I remember the line, uh, which he's, of course, written a, a follow-up book, Dichotomy of Leadership, which then dissects this idea. But there's no uh, bad teams, only bad leaders. And uh, they give a story about two boat crews, and I'm obsessed about Navy SEALs, but two boat crews, well, one captain you know, is doing a good job, one captain's blaming everybody else, and guess who's winning? The guy that's you know helping lead, and guess who keeps losing? The guy that complaints and you know doesn't take any responsibility and and i it was just like a gut punch uh and in that story uh they flip-flop captains and like hey boker one you know move over to boker two boker two you know and so forth and get lo and behold guess who is now competing and winning the same boat crew that was stinking and, and losing uh and so uh, I'm so passionate about this, uh, Carol. So I'm, I'm excited for this question. I hope I don't go on forever, but, um, I came home and I sat my team down. And I was like, Hey, I gotta tell you something. I've totally, totally blown it. I have completely failed you guys. Uh, I'm not focused. Um, emotionally pissed off sometimes or I'm not connected or I, I don't communicate this in a way that's healthy or uh, that's solving the problems. And, uh, and guess what, you know, owning and running a business uh, is hard and everybody wants to own a business and whatever. Uh, and they don't think about all the things that go into it. And especially once you have people on your team, uh, we, I, I take it seriously. And, uh, you know, if we're going to take the responsibility of having somebody on our team, we had to start realizing what that actually meant. And so all these things have kind of been, you know, bucket after bucket between, you know, core culture, core value, uh, training, onboarding process, uh, uh, defend the castle. Uh, what does it look like when we interview somebody? Uh, what is that process? Oh gosh, we're back to process. Oh, can we get rid of it? Uh, no. So, uh, uh, I'll start with the culture. So uh, we we try to do traction and implement traction a couple times in our business uh, EOS entrepreneurs operating system uh, a couple times, and we kind of we we ended up hiring a coach to help us. And you know, God forbid somebody uh, Nathan, you know, we're doing tens of millions of dollars a year. Yeah, I have a coach. I have multiple coaches. I'm um, in multiple masterminds. They so spend a lot of money on that. It's important. Uh, we all need a coach. We all need to be coaching. Uh, it's, it's both and problem. So, uh, you know, leadership, integrity, generosity, and drive. Those are our, our core values. And the core values come from the visionary of the company. Uh, they are not just some idea. They are you as the, as the entrepreneur. And we, uh, often can look at these things and, and wonder like, Hey, what, where did these things come from or what's important? And when you start to realize having people on your team that are not in culture, so let's say that, you know, I was in a, I was in a call today and, uh, the guy, uh, is his, his literally his only job is, well, maybe not only, but he, he, he lives and breathes understanding how to build teams and culture and 12%, uh, was the, <laughs> was the regularity at which a, a, uh, resume showed the job performance and if they would succeed 12%, that's insane. So think about when you look at that resume can, and I'm trying can, to remember, can, can you expand on that? Yeah. What do you mean by 12%? So as a predictor of their success in their job, 12 per, only 12% of the time was uh, the predictor, was was uh, the resume, the actual predictor of success with the person. So, hey, Jay, you can, you know, swing a hammer and go do that. Great. I'm going to put you in that job. The number one predictor of success was the cognitive ability to understand what was happening when they're learning something new. And number two was drive 
drive. And so in our business, leadership, integrity, generosity, and drive, we had to find people that had and shared those values. Those They valued those things and that they would be on the same team, rolling the same direction, like Jim Collins says, right? Everybody, the, the leadership, level five leadership, people in the right seats going the right direction, integrators on that, uh, you know, and, and the team is seeing that break in gas. And so we had to slow down, understand who we were first, and then we could start slowly getting people who are a little bit better quality and gosh, somebody's listening who used to work for me or something. Don't think that I don't value you as a person, but we did better at finding people who are in our tribe. And so as we find people who are better in our tribe, guess lo- guess what? Lo and behold, you also attract people who are do other stuff better than you. Uh, just like, you know, we're talking about music. When I play in a band, I want to play with the best players possible. I don't want to be the best player on the, on the, in the band. I want to be, you know, I want to have the best people I can get. And so, oh gosh, guess what happens in training? Now we have people that we identified that were on our team who say, Hey, Nathan, the onboarding process here, it sucks. You know why? Because there is none. Right? So now what do we do? Well, in core value, that's leadership. In core value, that's drive. Uh, um, We're integrity to say, hey, we don't know what we're doing and we're going to name that thing, right? And by the way, generosity, I'm going to spend all Saturday, all Sunday, all Monday, all Tuesday, the next week to figure this problem out because it's that important. And so, uh, how do we do that? Well, it's somebody that we brought into an organization that, by the way, I cannot figure that out because I don't, I'm not that smart, uh, but she can because she's done it. And now we have a template for onboarding. And guess what's in that template? It's a process. Ah, there we are about what are all the things that person needs to learn. Okay, now we can have a training opportunity. Now we identify who's the person who's going to do that training. First, let me show you. Then let's do it together. Then you do it and show me. And then guess what? We can sign off on that problem, sign off on that thing, and we can say, you are trained. And uh, having that autonomy and having that drive is part of that that uh, part about being on the bridge team, right? We want people who uh, are, are self-motivated. And so um, all that stuff you know, together creates the culture and then, and then moves it forward. And and it's not one moment of like, here's culture. And then here's core value. And we're doing all this at the same time, but it's kind of this amalgamation of different microcosmic moments that change and move that forward that then propel the other thing forward. So, uh, anyway, I, I love this topic and I am super passionate, especially now seeing it unfold in my business in real time. Wow. That was seven minutes of pure gold. I'm sitting here like <laughs> frantically taking notes. Um, and I know we asked for best practices. I figured you'd say, oh, okay, let's see. Here's one and here's another. I, I feel like you've like, you, you've, you've, well, obviously you've really lived that, but um, that was just, you, you, you were ready to go there. So, um, so many amazing nuggets in those last seven minutes. And, and I recommend anybody that's listening to this, go back and listen to that. Go back and listen to that last seven minutes. Yeah, it was an excellent, I think, I, I just have to interject and, and piggyback on what you just said. It's an excellent lesson in deep dive in the right way to grow a culture that really thrives and pushes your business forward together. It was just very beautifully stated. So thank you for going as deep into it as you did, because I think there are so many pieces in there that we can all use exponentially. It's great. Yeah. So I want to, I want to kind of touch on one that, that you hit tangentially and that is employees and hiring. And I know that you're very thoughtful in your hiring. Um, and it's something that, that you, you and your team work hard at. So let's pretend we have listeners out there who are getting ready to hire their first employee. Um, and again, we could be talking about real estate and if we're talking about real estate, maybe that's a project manager, maybe that's an acquisitions person, but it doesn't have to be, um, give us some best practices and some of the ways that, that you ensure that hiring for your team, uh, is a win-win and that you're bringing on people that are a good fit and, and to use your words, um, finding people in your tribe. Yeah. Great question. And boy. Oh man, you know, people is the hardest part of business. There's just no question about it. Uh, you know, other than if you were like me and you were trying to do uh, QuickBooks because like one third of your receipts would be in the back of your truck. One third would be, uh, you know, like somewhere that I don't know. And then one third would be like here somewhere. But other than that, 
it's definitely people. Uh, so first of all, I think if you're thinking about hiring or you have hired, let's say less than 10 people, go read the book or you've hired a hundred people and you're solving problems. But E-Myth is a great book and it tells a great story. And basically the synopsis is you all of a sudden you build a business and you're like, gosh, I need help. Uh, who's my first hire? You know, some probably somebody like me, right? I, I want to hire accounting um, and an administrator. And and I've lived this story over and over. And I read the book and I'm like, man, were they watching me? Like, have they seen me? Do they know me? Uh, they just didn't name my name in the book. But it's like, hey, you hire somebody, but you don't train them. You don't understand. You don't know what, what the processes are. And then you are upset and pissed off with the result. And I did this over and over and over again, and uh, it is a nightmare that won't end, and you don't understand as an entrepreneur, especially if you're that, you know, uh, visionary person because you're flying high above the details and you are not paying attention to it, and it's not something that you're good at, and so, of course, uh, so we started using... Well, there's a couple of things. Uh, I can't remember what book it was. Uh, I want to say maybe it's the Zappos uh, book, uh, Delivering Happiness, uh, which is a wonderful book. Uh, But thinking about what the pacing of that looks like, and it might not have been that book, but go read that one too. It's it's good. But uh, so we used to, in the perfect form for me, visionary guy uh, is like, be at dinner, have a glass of wine. Carol, I think you are sweet as can be and your resume looks great and man, we are connected and boom, we're in business. You know, it's like game on. Uh, Gosh, oh man, not to say that I wouldn't want to hire you. I'm sure you're not available for that. But, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is, uh, man, I, you know, my my sales and marketing manager uh, said, Nathan, you like everybody. <laughs> like, don't put him in an interview. <laughs> At least don't, you know. Uh, so we we had we we had to slow down, and uh, we had to identify first, right? Well, so let's we'll talk about the hiring process real quick, and then we'll talk about um, the job description. So I'm gonna make a note here. Uh, so from the hiring process standpoint, uh, at some point I got to talk to him, but I just want to see if I feel the vibe, right? I want to just make sure I feel the vibe and and I'm going to enjoy this person because I'm a people person and I want to make sure that they get the vision and they can dig that. Uh, and other than that, we need people on our team. So we now have literally four or five job interviews before we hire somebody. This is so important. I really want to, I want to go back to this real quick. Yeah. Too often in in business, we feel like um, it's a lot like bringing in a tenant and you feel like, okay, we have these fair housing rules. And if a tenant meets your qualifications, you have to bring them in legally. Um, and so, especially those of us in the real estate world, we tend to think, okay, do they meet the qualifications legally? We have to, we can't discriminate against them. Hiring in business is a little bit different. And you just said, do you feel the vibe with this person? And I know so many people out there that would never consider that one of those things that they look at in hiring because they feel like that's too subjective. It's too discriminating against certain people if, if I don't vibe with them. And I need to hire the best person for the job, whether they fit with me, whether they fit with the team. But, but what you're saying is it doesn't matter if they're necessarily the best person for their job. If they don't fit with your vibe and with your team's vibe, and as you said, fit into the tribe, don't hire them. Am I getting that right? A thousand percent. Uh, Patrick Lencioni, one of his 7,000 books, five, whatever, whatever of a, of a team. Uh, he, he talks about this story and you're like, man, we went to the competition. We got the best sales guy ever, you know, and he's amazing. And, but, but, you know, guess what? The dude's not in your culture. And so it doesn't matter if, if, it, well, back to that, back to that stat, right? So resumes is a twelve percent predictor of success in the in the job, uh, and so you know, it's funny. I didn't, I didn't even catch talking about that uh, about the vibe, but you know, think about like dating. You, you're going to spend a lot of time with this person, right? And and you don't have to be BFFs or anything, but you want to like them, and and you know, and being in business and being a business owner, it's important, obviously, knowing where the line is. And again, Jocko talks about this a ton in leadership. Uh, he's in a bunch of his books and podcasts and stuff. 
So I'm not, you know, this is not my idea, but uh, it's it's crucially important. Uh, both get it, want it, and the capacity to do it, uh, and it, it. You have to have all those components, and and culture is is definitely one. And you know, the cool part about the culture question, and and kind of back to did I did we did we hit that. Uh, Jay, feel that, good about- that that was perfect, and I love perfect. the fact that that I'm, I'm sitting here writing down all the books you're mentioning because <laughs> we have to add all these to the show notes. But Patrick Lincioni, the book is the five dysfunctions of a team. There you go. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. So the the we don't just go talk to somebody, look at a resume, and hire them anymore. It just doesn't happen. And so typically, we will have somebody who's fairly uh, detail oriented who looks at all of those applications uh, who come in. And we use WiseHire, which is great, and it has a disk profile attached with it. And if they can't follow the directions and put a resume and fill out a disk profile, then they're not going to fit for us. Uh, so step one, problem solved. Uh, and if you are applying for a new construction management position and you currently are a assistant manager at Arby's, you will also not qualify. Uh, so we get a lot of that too. But, you know, it's quick to, to weed them out, up or out, as I say. So um, we... Uh, Faster to yes, faster to no. I, I, it's also important, cl- clearly said like a, a visionary. Uh, but um, so we do that. We do a quick screener interview. Hey, let's actually just talk about the position. What, what, d- does it make sense? This is who we are. Who are you? Did you maybe look at our website? Uh, did you Do you have an understanding who you referred by? You know, let's just get an understanding. Hey, this person like, might look like this works. Uh, if it's in a management position, we'll then have, you know, interview with the management team. What does that look like? Uh, what, what is your, uh, how would you fit in with this team? How do you deal with, um, you know, difficult situations? How would you work in this situation? Talk about the specific details of that job. Uh, then we would, you know, sometimes if it's an upper end position, we also have our business coach interview them solo and we get a recording of that. They send it to us and their notes on, on that. So it's just a total third party person who uh, has our back, but also is not in the day-to-day grind. So they can look at that. I have a conversation with them, culture fit. Am I, are we going to dig it? You know, do we get the vibe? Uh, and then their department. So who's in the department? Who are they going to work with every day? What's that going to feel like, look like? Uh, the, these are the, the, the tightest touch points. Uh, and so working through all those things. And then we can say, gosh, did we actually take our time? And by the way, if this person really, you know, I, when I say to defend the castle, I mean that seriously. Like, I don't want to go hire this position in six months. I want somebody who not only gets it once it has the capacity to do it, but it's fired up to go do this job. And by the way, when we bring in another person that's in that department, they are going to want to do that as badly uh, or more so than the people that interviewed them and put them through a freaking gauntlet to make sure that we got the person on the team that really wants to be there. It's vital. And so when you go back and you say, okay, well, how do we make sure we get the right candidate in the first place? Well, did you have a clear job description? Is it obvious what the job is? And so you write through, you know, what is it that they would do? What are the qualifications? And then anything else that's important, like I want this, this person is driven, obsessed all the time to do it, right? Or very good in data and loves, you know, small details. We, we try to make it as obvious as possible what the person would be doing and what success looks like. And then we match that with the PI, the the predictive index, and uh, those guys uh, get lots of money for this tool, but it's amazing. Uh, And so we use it and we actually take the language of the personality profile of that person and we take it and we paste it in the job description. Woo, so guess what? When somebody uh, hears the language about like, oh my gosh, I love to design furniture and lay out a room, you know, uh, in a uh, high detail person that loves uh, design and working on their own, right? We're going to put that sucker right into that job description. So we are attracting people who would, who would do good, uh, do a good job with it. And we are repelling the people who uh, would not like that and doesn't fit in that like it, love it box. So uh, it's been kind of a twofold problem uh, process rather uh, as we've started to get a lot better, I would say at the on. Um, uh, you know, interviewing and onboarding. Yeah. And, and one of the things that you kind of uh, uh, implied that I really believe in, and I'm a firm believer in, and I, I spent much of my career at Microsoft, and this was a, a, a very important hiring concept at that company, uh, which is don't settle. 
um, we used to have a, a thing where if you would be interviewed by eight or 10 people and, and you could absolutely be interviewed by eight or 10 or 15 people over the course of several interviews um, at that company, um, if a single person says no, it's a no. And it's not democracy. It's not, hey, we need five out of out of seven to, to say yes. If somebody has reservations, it's probably not a good fit. And it, it's better to wait for somebody that's going to get unanimous agreement amongst the team members um, than it is to, to fill a, a warm body in a seat. Because if you put a warm body in a seat just because you really need somebody, they're going to end up costing more time, more money, more effort, more frustration than not having somebody at all. 100%. Plus, plus it, it gives your team an opportunity to have a voice too, which is huge. Yeah. I'm curious. I wanted to follow up on that point a bit more about all the different personalities on your team and everything and, and the hiring process and bringing new people in. I'm curious, a business of your size, of your magnitude, of having all of these different types of roles necessary to keep your company thriving – are you finding that your new hires are typically in the real estate space before they come to you? Or are you finding a lot of good fits outside of your industry as well? Just talk to us more about that. That's a great question. Uh, you know, somebody like in a new construction manager or project manager, we found that somebody that has some more experience has been helpful at times, but it's kind of the old dog new tricks too. And also did we get our, our um, process and that, that those sort of things clear uh, as far as like the, the other things, whether it's in acquisitions or um, in transactions or, you know, sales um, <clears throat> we've had a lot of non real estate people. And I think, you know, that's, that's again, back to that culture and clear job description. And then, you know, more and more and more and more and more, I find that it's, it's less about, like, were you an acquisitions agent and, uh, what are you like? Uh, what, are, what is your curiosity? Do you want to do this? What, what is your natural, um, uh, bent? Did you spend like me multiple years working in Best Buy in high school for 12 bucks an hour, whatever it was. And they, they silently turn you into a sales assassin and you don't even realize it. Uh, and then you wake up one day and you're like, man, that's what all those awful Saturday morning, stupid meetings and role playing was about. Oh, <laughs> dang. You know, I, so to me, it's like, if we can find somebody that really wants to get after it and that it makes sense, uh, or that we can, you know, coach people up too. Right. So that's the other thing is that, uh, it, it's, it's a constant thing. And I tell my team this all the time. I expect me myself to earn my seat every day. And I expect you to earn your seat every day. It's a both and problem. And so the person that you were hired on March 4th or whatever, uh, I expect you to be better today better at the team and better at your job and in not just in a selfish for me way, but in a selfish for your team, right? You're getting after it to, to get better as a team and, and operate. So, um, I don't know if I went on too much of a tangent there, but no, yeah, that's, that's great. That's, I loved yeah, it. I loved it. And yeah. I wanted to say too, Jay, I think, and, and Nathan, I think it's one of those cool things that, um, I think a lot of us, we take this whole, I don't want to say we take this real estate investing profession for granted, but the nice thing about when we're talking about going outside of the space to bring new people in, you got to love that real estate investing has become such a thing because, of course, people think it's such a big glamorous thing. They don't realize what the reality (laughs) of it is. But I think I would expect in our experience and maybe with you, too, it just helps draw your pool of applicants, right? Because they look at bridge turnkey investments. it's this awesomely thriving real estate investing company, and they want to get in on the action, right? So I just think that's it's just a great reminder to all of us out there who are in this space and in, in this these opportunities we create for people that they really enjoy. Yeah, it's, it's a huge impact. And I think the other thing about that is, you know, for me personally, and my gifts was like, how did I communicate and tell the story? I got lucky, you know, got on bigger pockets early. Uh, when it was not nearly as big as it is. And, um, you know, so for instance, literally a year and a half ago or so, we launched a meetup in KC and literally took over as the largest real estate meetup in like four months. And uh, so, it, and it was just one of those things that just blew up and that you almost 10,000, like 
just just shy of 9,000 people on the Facebook page at this point and uh and 20,000 some posts a day. It's just ridiculous. Uh, the amount of, um, activity in there. Uh, I might've stated that wrong, but it's a lot. I'm not, a, I'm not uh, the data guy. So <laughs> forgive me uh, for whatever I just said, ignore the numbers, but, um, it, it grew, it grew fast and it's gotten a lot of attention. And, and the cool part about that is it's, it definitely has funneled people who maybe would not have seen our company uh, before, uh, so it gives that attention as well as as well as um, you know, man, it's really hard to get it right, and it's really easy to screw stuff up, and so it also puts a big target on your back uh, as a business and as a human, and so to make sure, like, hey, we're living up to whatever this thing is that has now gone far beyond Nathan Brooks, uh, a bridge turnkey. It is it, its own animal and it's its own thing. And, and, uh, so it's, it's a big, uh, it's a big undertaking to also manage that. That's awesome. Um, before we get into the four more segment of the show, um, I, I do want to take advantage of the fact that we have you, here with us and we have a very large real estate audience. Um, so we've spent most of this episode talking about general business topics and growing a business. Um, but I would like to talk about two kind of more specific real estate topics, uh, for those real estate investors who are listening that are, that are excited to have somebody that's doing 500 deals in five, in five years, uh, with us. I'd love to talk about one, where you're finding deals, what your acquisition, your, your, your best acquisition strategies are today. Um, and, and we know that with COVID and, and things that have changed over the last year, that might be different than where it was even a few months ago. Um, and number two, um, how do you finance your deals? Uh, what, what, what's your primary method of financing your business or your individual deals? Do you do syndications? Do you raise private money? Do you raise bank money? Do you, what do, what do you do there? So uh, again, just recap, where are you finding your deals and where are you finding your money? Awesome. Uh, so finding deals, Whew, what a nightmare. Uh, <laughs> we're in KC, right? Uh, and I'm going to actually uh, give some uh, world news that's not out there anywhere in the world currently. So it's like for, for real, uh, most uh Today is the day. This moment is the moment here, uh, one forty nine Central Time. But um, we we both used it to expand in uh, segment as well as market, and uh, as well as get better at, at just buying stuff. So first, uh, we have branched in a new construction, which we thought we would start building like middle of last year or something. I think we thought we would have one you know house on the ground by like September of nineteen, and I think we delivered our first house. Uh, like a year later or something like that. Okay. Uh, so, but, um, you know, this year we'll probably put it, you know, somewhere around 20, 22 houses on the ground in year one, new wow. construction. Uh, and also, uh, you know, we're literally launching this today on a webinar for uh, bridge. Uh, so we have moved into the Tulsa market. And so we will, uh, if we hit our target, we'll put about 40 houses on the ground, new construction in Tulsa next year. And, uh, by the way, that 500 number is going to get blown out of the water when we add year six, because we're going to put like 300 houses on the ground between new construction and renovation in 2021. So that's happening. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, so sorry to take the moment on that, but, uh, I've new construction ha, uh, has been a, a cool thing and we could do a whole nother you know, show on that too, but, um, new construction, underwriting lots and having, so that's just created another segment for us. It's also a little bit larger profit margin per deal. It's more expensive too, but it takes a little longer, but it has been a, another center, a uh, profit center. Uh, but finding deals, uh, this, <laughs> this is going to sound maybe, too simple, but it, it comes down to doing the work in relationships. And so, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, you have to actually do the work. You can't like will it, uh, unless you're, you know, Yoda or whatever, uh, you're not going to bring it in without, you know, having, <laughs> uh, I'm a big star Wars fan, but man, I, I don't have those superpowers. Uh, so my superpower is do the work. And so what does that mean? It's wholesalers, it's realtors, it's people that you know, and it's literally not like, yo, send me some deals. Uh, you know, it, that does not help, uh, DM me, man. Uh, I, it just drives me bonkers. Uh, and I have the meetup and so I get to watch this all the time or I got this house in this one place that's right by this one street. <clears throat> Call me, hit me up. 
I got it. It's a good deal. Uh, you know, <laughs> whew, that drives me crazy. Anyway, so how about I am Nathan. I am in acquisitions for Bridge Turnkey. Uh, we buy houses typically between 100,000 and 160,000 ARV. Uh, we typically spend 30 to 35,000 in construction per project. So we need to have room to actually do a full renovation on this property because we care and we do a good job. Uh, we're quick. We're cash, we're professional, yada, yada. And guess what? All those things, we see those on signs and whatever, but then you have to actually show the people what you can do. And so, you know, we have the conversation. And if you are not that, if you are not the cash guy, and you're actually like, hey, I got one private lender and he is 50-50. Like, say that. I'm new. I'm not sure what I'm doing. By the way, this is my mentor, uh, Carol. She's helping me, uh, making sure I don't do something stupid. So I, I love having transparency in whatever the goal is. And so we, you know, on online or Facebook or in our meetup or whatever, we'll say, hey, we're buying four or five houses. You know, I see other people post that. I know they're not buying that many houses. But so we're in integrity with what we're saying. We are consistent with our message and we are relentless with follow-up and building relationships. And so it's really not about the deal. It's about the relationship. And so when you come back to that and you say, okay, uh, back to the, you know, early conversation we were having in process, we track every day our acquisitions people. And this, this actually just, this change just happened and it implemented probably within the last month or six weeks. So we weren't really uh, tracking with that because guess who was in acquisitions and management? This guy, uh, hopefully soon that'll change. Uh, and thank goodness my business partner is in there now helping and lo and behold, we're hitting our numbers, right? So, uh, what a crazy idea. Entrepreneurs, visionaries get out (laughs) of the management and detail. Uh, it, it is a nightmare, right? And you were not meant to do that job. So, uh, but you also have to do it until you can't and don't have to. So, uh, for us, it's been, you know, clear on the buy box. I, I coach my team all the time. Faster to yes, faster to no. Time to target. Let's be first. Let's let's buy every deal that we can buy. Let's let's tell them why it's better working with us. And it is. And by the way, this is our process, or this is our Danny, you know, our transactions person, or this is what's gonna happen with this house. And by the way, we're not wholesaling it to five other people or putting it, you know, chain contracting it. We're actually taking the risk of putting this house down under contract, funding it and renovating it and selling it to a client who actually really cares. And we're going to make sure we get a great tenant who wants to make this place home. So we just tell the whole story and we can be honest and transparent. So that was probably a really long answer to a very short question. Finding deals, uh, relationships, Tulsa, (laughs) new construction. Uh, and, and the most important thing is, and and I just want to highlight this because this is, this is so, so important when it comes to finding deals. It doesn't matter if you're using direct mail. It doesn't matter if you're cold calling, doesn't matter if you're using bandit signs, if you're going off the MLS, doesn't matter what the specific strategy is. Make sure you're working hard because all of those strategies can work if you're willing to put in the time and the effort and work smart. Mm -hmm. And, and so I, I just, I loved your point about you got to work hard. There's no magic bullet. Nope. Simple, but not easy. And I will mention over that 500 or so houses, uh, which is not a uh, scientifically proven number, but it is in that range. Uh, to be clear, uh, that, uh, that we've done over the last five years or so, uh, including, you know, a vast majority of those last two years, uh, we don't really have a direct seller business. So people out there who are like, man, I can't find a deal on MLS or I can't find a deal from a wholesaler or whatever. You're wrong. You know, you have to just figure out what is the actual problem and don't make the problem, you know, money the problem or the wholesaler the problem or whatever, like make the problem the problem. What, what is it that we need to do to actually solve this problem? So, uh, number two, financing deals. Uh, we, (laughs) so I think it was like the second week of actual lockdown of COVID, like, like the full blown, you know, panic situation. Uh, we got four phone calls, uh, from four different banks 
uh, one million refinance approved, another million dollar refinance approved, a three million dollar guidance line, and another three million dollar guidance line. Now it's like the you know five years to overnight success, as my business partner says, and it was like that. You know, all of a sudden, boom, we had all this bank money, millions and millions of dollars. Uh, but for the last five years, they you know we couldn't find anybody that thought that we were worthwhile um, investing, at least at that level. But over that time, it had forced us to get really good at raising private money. So we pay a fair, uh, solid return, uh, and we have a really, really simple process for those people. They can use their IRA money, they can use regular cash, whatever. So uh, we had raised uh, a, a bunch of money and consistently paid those investors all the time and consistently made sure that we were taking care of our people. And so uh, you know that over the course of time has just you know paid dividends both for our, our investors uh, that buy houses as well as the folks who have you know been uh, you know lending as well. And, and have you found that COVID has made, uh, your financing piece more difficult or easier, um, just given all the different conditions out there? You know, there was about two or three weeks there that uh, were were pretty awful, you know, from the standpoint of the clients specifically, you know, people were uncomfortable under contract. Uh, but really from the financing, you know, I think it's been a bigger challenge with the interest rate uh, in the refinance market and just getting people to get them done. Uh, having appraisers in properties that are occupied has been a challenge. Uh, you know, finding deals, you know, in Kansas city, it's the eighth highest appreciating market, the second quarter of 2020, which is bonkers. Why KC would be there. Uh, we have 1.3 months of inventory on our, uh, on the MLS, which is also bonkers. I think it's what four to six months is, you know, a uh, healthy balance. So, it's just a, 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 it's really incredibly difficult market specifically in the buying. I think the, the, you know, finding deals, the, the lending and financing really has not been a challenge up to this point, not to say that it couldn't be a challenge in the future. Uh, but for us, since we controlled our destiny on the lending side and we had built relationships there instead of just having some hard money lender that has some, you know, specific amount or deals or whatever, you know, it really gives us a, an advantage. And we can tell that story you know, back to that, you know, building relationships and, and buying deals. You know, you can tell that same story. Hey, we can close. That's awesome. I, I could talk to you for another two hours about all this <laughs> stuff, but we are running along on this show. So I want to jump into the final segment of the show, the segment we call four more, where Carol and I ask you the same four questions that we ask all of our guests. And then the more part of the four more, uh, where you telling, you tell our listeners where they can find out more about you and your business. Does that sound good? Sounds great. Okay. I will take question number one. So Nathan, what was your very first or your very worst job? And what lessons did you take from it that you're still using today? Oh man. I've had so many of those jobs, whether it was uh, making pizzas at Godfather's, uh, was, uh, you know, running as the busboy at a uh, mafia run Italian restaurant. Um, gosh, working at a dive place in, uh, you know, <laughs> Maryland uh, for a summer, uh, running a bar, landscaping business. Man, I've done a ton of stuff over the years. And, you know, I think. The bottom line is uh, <laughs> having fun and finding yourself. And, you know, I, I, I'm not really a negative person. And my parents have told a story of like, I was in super trouble as a kid. And, and that, and, you know, and they're like, why aren't you upset? And they're like, well, just because I did something wrong doesn't mean I can't be happy. And, you know, just having, for me, it's been that um, positivity. And uh, making a decision that whatever that job is, like, hey, I'm going to put food on the table or I'm going to do whatever it is or I'm going to solve this problem in the business or I'm going to make pizzas or whatever it is, but I'm going to be awesome at it. I'm going to do a great job. I'm going to learn something from it. And uh, then it's going to give me that, you know, uh, whatever nugget it is that is good or bad uh, culture or, or process or business or management or whatever. And I can take that and take that little seed, uh, and, and move on to the next one. Nathan, I absolutely love that. Such a good answer. It was fun. Okay. <laughs> Here's number two. What is the best piece of advice that you have for small business owners or young entrepreneurs that you haven't mentioned yet here today? You know, I'm not sure if I stated it 
really, really plainly and clearly. So I'll just state it again, which is focus. And uh, if you are going to bed at night and you're thinking about it in the morning when you wake up, then you know you are on the right track for the thing that you are wanting to obsess about. And then have a filter of somebody who is a data-driven person who can look at that and think about it and allow them to put holes in your ideas and to um, question you on it and challenge you on it and rip it apart and put it back together. And, And the better you are at listening, and the better you are at shutting up and letting other people uh, share input, once you you know create the vision, create the ideas, but then allow uh, space to uh, listen and uh, other people to take ownership of your ideas, uh, the the more successful, the more happy, and the better the thing's gonna go. Love that, absolutely love that. Okay, question number three. This is where I ask you your favorite business or technical book. Um, (laughs) Let's see. You have now mentioned in this episode, Traction, Rocket Fuel, Extreme Ownership. Um, You mentioned Delivering Happiness and The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. So we already have five books. I'm going to make you pick a different one. So besides those five, oh, and the E-Myth. I I missed the E-Myth. So six books. Um, If you had to pick a different book, to recommend to audience, what would that book be? No question. And uh, books are so important. By the way, obviously, I'm obsessed about books. Uh, or maybe not obviously, but talking about this many. And we also read them as a team every Wednesday. We have a culture meeting. Uh, not It's not called culture, but our whole team gets together every Wednesday. And uh, pre-COVID, we were doing that in person. We called it Leadership Lunch and literally reading books together. Uh, so I'm uh, Go-Giver was one that we did, but uh, Never Split the Difference is the book I'm going to go with because, uh, you know, I got to meet uh, the author virtually, uh, former FBI negotiator, and the book is just full of nuggets and things that uh, make you a verbal tactical ninja and, uh, and not in a way that you could or should take advantage of people, but it gives you tools in a, in a, in a superpower in a way that uh, you would not use. And when you're trying to say the same thing and you can restructure via labels and uh, labeling and mirrors and, um, you know, structuring your questions. So, uh, man, that's a monster book. And if you really like that, then read Tony Robbins and limited power. And it's like a next level of that. So. Love it. Okay. You gave me three to add to the list. So never split the difference is the big one. That's by Chris Voss. Um, and I will also add Tony Robbins to the list as well. Super. Okay. The fourth and my most fun question is what is something Nathan that either in your work life or one of your, I want to say, I've got to just turn our listeners in onto the fact that you're this amazing musician and you are this massively huge award-winning MMA fighter and so many other things. You are so multifaceted. I can't even stand it. So in one of your aspects of your amazing life, whether it's one of those or with your family or at work or whatever, however, wherever, what is something along the way that you have splurged on? whether it's a material thing or an experience or whatever, that was totally and entirely worth it. Oh, man. Um, By the way, I I have fought in an MMA fight, but I wouldn't necessarily, I'm awarded there. Uh, But I am on an amazing team uh, there for sure. Uh, Glory MMA, I'll give them a little shout out. And Lee Summit, Missouri. Uh, They got a bunch of people in the UFC, by the way. Sorry to get off track. Okay, so uh, Splurge, you know, I have a lot of different things that uh, I enjoy, and I, I obsess, and so I, I enjoy obsessing about different things. So uh, I'll give you two, if that's okay. So one for me and one for uh, we. So for me, it was uh, I have become a, a watch guy, and I'm uh, definitely obsessed about watches. I love movements and how they work and uh, how the components come together. And did you know on the face of a watch, when you look at automatic movement, that you know all the things that are happening on that watch, it's the complexity of the movement that makes it work. And uh, so... You know, I'm staring at my uh, Rolex root beer, which is a cool watch and hard to get a hold of. And it's ridiculously expensive and stupid, but I really enjoy it. And so uh, that's that's something that uh, has been fun for me. And second would be, 
we just picked up a little center console fishing boat because my son has become like super obsessed about fishing. And so he and I literally, you know, this summer we probably caught hundreds literally of fish and spent hours and hours and hours uh, fishing. And he's become quite the fisherman too, by the way, and he's nine. And uh, so we bought this little center console fishing boat and uh it's been just a blast and we've we've been learning and obsessing about fishing and uh having fun as a family doing it those are both such awesome splurges thank you for sharing Mm -hmm. i i love that okay um that was the four part of the four more now for the more part of the four more can you tell our listeners where they can find out more about you about your company and anything else that you would like to share with us yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, thank you again for having me on, Jay and Carol. This is uh, such a pleasure and uh, so humbled by the opportunity and, and seriously love you guys. And think uh, for people who are watching, they are just as cool uh, as you think they are. Maybe, maybe not, if not more. So um, good people and uh, great people and, and legitimate. So, uh, you know, our company is BridgeTurnKey.com. And uh, you can check out what we do there. Both our renovation properties, our new construction properties, and uh, I'm so freaking pumped about Tulsa. Uh, it's just so cool to um, kind of have a secondary market and something our clients have been asking about for a while. So we can deliver on that. It's great for us, great for our company, uh, great for our clients. So it's a win, win, win. Uh, we're on Facebook, or I'm on Facebook. You can just search me, Nathan Brooks. I do get a rather large amount of um friend invites. Uh, so please shoot me a message if it's something specific and, uh, connecting there is great. And then, uh, and I'm on Instagram too. I don't even know what my handle is. Uh, Nathan Brooks REI or something like that. <laughs> I'll have to check that down. Uh, but, um, once you watch the uh, social dilemma, you kind of wonder about that, but, uh, <laughs> in any case, uh, and, and last but not least, uh, we have a meetup here in Kansas City, uh, Bridge Real Estate Investing Meetup. We got a great page there, especially you know people everywhere uh, in the U.S. are you know on there, but also Midwest and, and locally there. So uh, those awesome. are kind have of have any good guests upcoming at your at your meetup. <laughs> well, it just so happens uh, the timing we did not plan it this way, but uh, the one and only Mr. J. Scott uh, will be uh, uh, a week from today, and I will say, dude, we have the coolest space and the coolest thing, and and this COVID thing is really putting a damn uh, uh, on the, on the whole in person, but, uh, regardless, I know you're going to bring some fire and thunder and uh, we get to reverse roles here, uh, which will be a blast. Yeah. So anybody out there that, uh, wants to, to hang out with, uh, Nathan and myself next week, actually it's this week when you're listening to this, True. um, go, 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 uh, to the bridge turnkey page or, or the, uh, I'm sorry, the, what, bridge- what's the, what's Bridge Real Estate Investing Meetup, and please just answer the couple questions. Uh, it's amazing. We probably would have added, you know, thousands of more people, but we don't just let anybody in. We want you to be interested. Back to culture, back to whatever. Like, take the five seconds, fill out the questions, and uh, come get after it with us there. So it'll be great. Cool. Join join the group on Facebook, and then sign up for uh, for the uh, for the Bridge Turnkey Meetup. It's gonna be awesome, Nathan. Thank you so much. This has been absolutely amazing. I am so, Carol and I, I think I speak for both of us. We're so happy to be able to call you a friend and colleague and, and we appreciate your, your coming and sharing all your amazing knowledge and experience with, with us and our listeners today. Thank you. And I, I couldn't agree more and likewise. So thank you guys. And uh, thank you, Nathan. We thank, we thank the world of you and we're so grateful to have you on the show and can't wait to till the next time. Thank you. Likewise. Talk to you soon. Likewise. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Seriously, I absolutely loved everything Nathan had to say, right? I think he did such a great job really approaching the conversation from the business side of his real estate business, right? And I especially loved how he not only gave us really a blueprint of actionable steps about hiring the right people and integrating them into your business, but he also really stressed how absolutely critical it is for the ongoing strength and growth of your business to get those people in in the first place.
And here's the thing I love. We talked about metrics. Well, here's a metric for you. I think this episode probably had more tips per minute than any episode we did. I mean, just <laughs> literally jam-packed with, with, with amazing tips. Agreed. So, okay. Well, this has been a long one. So we are going to give everybody the rest of their day back. Thank you for tuning in and have an amazing, happy, healthy, and fantastic rest of your week, everybody. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next week. She's Carol. I'm Jay. Now feel the vibe with people in your tribe today. Mm, nice. I like it. It's better and better every week. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Have a everybody. super week. Thanks for listening. See ya. <laughs>